Mm. Good afternoon. We are now looking at the second uh, lecture. Uh, like I said, it's actually a long, 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 long journey that we have, which is actually going to end in June. So we might just be meeting so often uh, so that we, we try and and, and, and and push. Yeah, so yesterday we looked at the conceptual framework and under the conceptual framework, after the conceptual framework, we also looked at the, the regulatory framework. We know we should actually appreciate that our financials, like in Zambia, the financial statements are actually um, guided by the International Accounting Standards Board, as well as the Company Act of 2017. We did look at one of the most underlying assumptions when you are preparing financial statements, and that is the going concern. We gave an example of a person who is actually in the hospital, maybe on a deathbed, yet paying for tuition for the forthcoming semester. Because that person believes that he will still be around. He is not going to die. He's not going anywhere. But maybe the experts, such as med the medical experts, may have a different view of what he believes in. That is when now one is testing the assumption of a going, of going concern. So when you look at the audited financial statements, the first thing that they do, there is what they call a statement of responsibility. This is done by the directors. This is where they themselves, they are saying they are okay. They don't see their organization going under in the next 12 months. They bring in like a disclaimer. And let me just read a component of, of of that. The directors, NS, you are calling. Yes, Ernest. On, on, on the, yes, Ernest. I asked an IT guy to assist me on where I, whether I should also be contributing where I want to. Yeah, yeah, please ask the, the, the IT person to help you. Person. Okay. Yes, but for now, I'm, I'm picking whatever. Okay, yes. but we also want you to be contributing. Yes. Uh, okay. uh, <laughs> So Sidin uh, uh, and Ennis, there is, should be the, the, the last, third last uh, paragraph. It reads, the directors have made an assessment of the ability of the company to continue as a going concern and have no reason to believe that the business will not be going concern for at least 12 months from the date of this statement. So this is a sick person who is actually in the hospital and is confirming to the doctor that me, I'm okay. And that is how the concept of a going concern is. It is a very important concept. Then now it is up to the auditors to come up with an opinion, the audit opinion, and doubt or attest to the going concern assumption that has been already pushed by the directors. Remember, yes, in theory, we know that you have a department that actually prepares these financial statements. But in reality is that the financial statements are prepared by the directors. So they take the responsibility of each and every number that is in that particular document. So
So this is where they're going concern. Now I know we'll never forget this part. Yeah, sitting. I know you're mute. Can you? Yeah, just unmute. Yeah. <coughs> sure, sure. We'll never forget this one. Mm -hmm. And that now it is arriving home because now we can even connect it with the audit report. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we go on now. Here, these are basically the things that we looked at yesterday, the fundamental qualitative characteristics. Obviously, we, you do not forget, you should know that the information must be relevant and the relevance is connected to decision making, just that. So here you're actually looking at nature and materiality. Then the second thing is faithful information. It's not just about relationships that have to be faithful. Even information itself has to be faithful. So yeah, for, yeah. for a relationship to be faithful, I believe that it's the information that has to be faithful. <laughs> Isn't it? Sure. If sure. there are a lot of lies, then it, it becomes difficult to have a faithful relationship. So in short, sure. what drives a, a faithful relationship is faithful information, which we looked at. And, 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 and we went on to analyze what this faithful information means. We are actually saying, if faithful information one, it should actually be unbiased. And it should be free from error. Mm -hmm. So if it is objective and free from error, then we have faith in this information. Then this information becomes faithful information, which then now is going to build a faithful relationship. Sure. And how do, how do we connect this to the audited financial statements, guys? Come here. This is where now it shows. In our opinion, the financial statements give a true and fair view of the financial position of Lafarge Zambia Limited. We conducted our audit in accordance with the international standards on auditing, it says our responsibility under those standards are further described. In the auditor's report, the responsibilities for the audit of the financial statement section of our report. We are independent of the company in accordance with section 290 and 291 of the financial, of the International Ethics Standards Boards for Accountants. So here they are actually coming up with their opinion and they're saying they are looking at the true and fair. What does it mean? It basically means that they now they trust the information that has been given to them, meaning that this information is relevant to whoever would want to make decisions. That is to the users of accounting information. So the auditors they come in as referees to look at this particular data to test the two fundamental uh, elements of what a qualitative information, what good information is. One, they test the relevance. Is this information that has been given, is it relevant? And that relevance, again, it is linked to the standards and methodologies they are using. They go to ESAS, they also look at International Accounting Standards Board, they also reference the 2017 uh, Companies Act. Brilliant, very brilliant. But they don't stop there on relevance, guys. They go on now to look at the faithful information. And this is why they say this is true and fair. Meaning that they have confidence in that information. First, they even went on to raise, info, to raise some certain concerns that are very discomforting to them. And they, first, they wanted management to sort them out. They go on to say key audit matters, which they felt that if these, these are material issues that have to be sorted out, 
if they are left out, then this information is, going to go, is not going to be faithful information. It is not going to be relevant information which they can rely on. So they go on to say, key audit matters are those matters that in our professional judgment were of more significant in our audit of the financial statements of the current period. These matters we address in the context of our audit of the financial statements as a whole. So they look at the key audit matter, one of them was equity investment in Bayer Cement Company Limited. The company owns 14% of the issued ordinary equity capital of Bayer Cement Company Limited, a related company incorporated and operating in Tanzania. The company has designated the investment in Bayer Cement Company Limited as at fair value through statement of profit or loss upon initial recognition. This is IFRS 9 now. This financial asset is designed upon initial recognition on the basis that it is part of a group of financial assets which are managed and have their performance evaluated on a fair value basis in accordance with the risk management and investment strategies of the company. The company used a discounted free cash flow valuation method to determine the fair value of the investment of Mbeya Cement Company Limited. DCF method involves forecasting free cash flows that will accrue to shareholders and discounting them at an appropriate discount factor. We consider this as a key audit matter as the fair value determination is subjective to estimation and as to estimation and uncertainty as it is dependent upon the cash flow forecast and discount rate. So this was a key issue to them, which could have actually, it was material, which could have actually rendered those fundamental elements of good accounting information to be distorted. That is relevance and faithful information. And they presented that, and this is how the matter was addressed in our audit. And they, they were satisfied that this matter was addressed. Otherwise, they could have qualified the, 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 the financials. We performed the following procedures to assess the appropriateness of the valuation. We evaluated the appropriateness of the discount free cash flow valuation methodology to determine the fair value of the equity investment. We review the reasonableness of the cash flow forecast by comparing budget to actual balances over the past three years. We also reviewed prior year growth rates and compared to projections made. We reviewed overall economic and business environment of Tanzania and company performance in the current year to support the cash flow forecast. We engaged valuation experts to review the reasonableness of the discount rate used and all inputs of this estimation using the determination of this country rate was independently verified with reliable third party sources. We determined that the fair value recorded by the entity is appropriate and no impairment of the investment is required. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. So, here now on the qualitative characteristics that was actually done. On the fundamental qualitative characteristics that was done, they satisfied themselves that all that data, all the information was okay. It was free from bias, free from error. It was neutral. It is relevant. All the material matters that were raised have actually been addressed. Addressed. So these things, <laughs> Sidin uh, and Ernest, these things are so practical. For me, I've always said, you know, I've, I've been training, I've been teaching, I used to teach management accounts, performance management for so many years. And yeah. I used to set even exams in there, the Zika exams. But I've always said, it is very easy to pass financial reporting because financial reporting, you don't need to use a mind of your own. They guide you. It's like you're just going through a manual book. Everything is guided. But sometimes students, they don't know that these things, you can relate them to what is happening out there. And that is when it becomes more interesting. Then at that time, you have reached, you have hit the Eureka, you can see things. Mm -hmm. 
Interesting. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. you need the men. Yeah. You need the men to open the, you know, the the veil. Otherwise, yeah. you look at it as just uh, something that is so academic and, mm. yeah. Mm. Great, great. Sure. So this is how we approach. For me, I look at. I always joke that our academy is like it's yearly. It's practical. Mm. Because the person that is training you has done a lot of things in the industry. <laughs> These are things sure. that we do. I mean, I, I, I am I'm one of the members of the IR team of which our, our, our integrated reports, they are accessible they're in public domain. You just Google, it says this called integrated reports 2018. You'll see those, those reports, we prepare them. So we, I understand these things. I'm not just coming from school, passing these exams and being made a, a lecturer, no. So, and this is what, how we are going to approach, whether it's group accounts, whether we are dealing with associates, we are dealing with joint ventures, it will be very practical. If we are looking at the cash flows, it will be practical. No theory with me. I don't even want to know any theory. <laughs> you get what I'm saying, Sidney? And this sure. is how you pass exams. Sure, sure. <laughs> this is why I always refer, I always prefer someone not to call me Mr. or Sir, or they'll tell you, I think Peggy told you how they used to call me. They would call me coach or coach cat or whatever, because I'm truly a coach for you. So I'm your personal coach. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. well, I'm excited and uh, you don't know the enthusiasm you have created. Hmm. Uh, so now, here, this is on enhancing qualitative characteristics. What we are actually saying, when you call yourself that you are the best, what basis are you using? Mm. When you, and similarly to the company, when the company says it did not perform well, what basis is it using? Or it performed well, or remarkably well, <laughs> or it performed outstanding. What basis are they using? This is where now enhancing qualitative characteristics come in. These things, they are practical seeding. So meaning that the data must be, the, the accounting information must be comparable. Mm. You get that? The, the data must be comparable. This data must be verifiable. Mm. So on the verifiability of this data, how do we get to know that the data was verified? We go back to the accountant, to the independent auditor's report. Down here, what are they saying? Wait, 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 wait. All inputs of estimation used in the determination of the discount rate was independently verified with reliable third party sources, meaning that all that information that is coming into this to financials into the financials has been verified. So this information must be verifiable. So if I say, if I say, uh, let me with the cash that is actually sitting in our financials, in the balance sheet. Give me a bank statement. So that that bank statement, whatever is in that bank statement, that schedule mm -hmm. on the bank reconciliation, it should reconcile with the number I'm seeing in the balance sheet. And that number in the balance sheet, I should be able to go back to check how much money is in the bank. How much money is still what you call cash in hand. So all I'm doing is that each statement, whatever I'm looking at in the financial statement, in the balance sheet, is something that I can verify. If I'm looking at the trade payables trade pay in the balance sheet, I should actually ask for the list of payables, what you call a schedule of payables. Mm -hmm. And it should balance with what is in the balance sheet. It should match with what is in the balance sheet. I'm just verifying. Any mismatch mm -hmm. 
if they are material, then that becomes a problem. I'll even ask the aging analysis for those payables. I'll ask the aging analysis for the receivables, the people that I claim owe me money. But you see the auditors, because they want to verify this data, they will also go to the third party. So if I say, Ernest owes me 200 kwacha, and I show it in my schedule that 200 kwacha is owed by Ernest. They all go to NS, they would want NS to do a statement to accept or deny. So the NS will also push in a statement where it's actually going to, more or less like confirmations. Mm. So NS if says NS says 1,500, then there's a problem now, there's a 500 which is, becomes a problem. So when you hear the issues of information uh, to be, that, that it should be verifiable, that is what they mean. That is a, how you enhance qualitative characteristics of your account information. Because all you are doing, you want this information to be faithful. I don't know if you are able now to connect these things. So sure, how, sure. how do we get to know this? Let's just check down here on that verifiability. Mm -hmm. So for example, on, on, on trade receivables, 19.1. So this amount here, 73861, is a product of obviously a schedule or schedule as you pronounce it, depending how, where you're coming from. <laughs> so, this note, we have to go to that note to check what is under trade receivables and other receivables. If we go again, for example, on lenders. Interesting, these guys have no lenders, huh? They have very good books. Lafage, <laughs> Okay, so, so we, we check on trade for receivables. Some time. Yeah, yeah. You check, let's say, here on trade receivables, which is 73 million, 74 million, not 19. Yes. So on note 19, they will all show that, but they all have accompanying schedules, which will show, which will show, which will show what makes up these receivables. If you come here, like even on the related party transaction, they will show all these related party transactions. They have to verify. If they go to if they go to to payables, for example, trade and other payables, so they will show as well. This is a schedule only payables. Mm -hmm. So they put in all these things. So meaning that this information has been verified. If we say we owe, we owe John Banda 500 kwacha, they will ask John Banda how much he's owed by us. So it's been written. And these things have to match because they're trying to verify this information from third parties. So the information must be verifiable. Yeah, it's here. Yeah, it's here. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense, like mm -hmm. Comparability. Here now, we are actually looking at 
identifying because you're identifying you want to compare with the previous years mostly you find that they'll put maybe for three years for four years for five years to compare so that you see where you are and that is one of that is one of the ways in which you can actually enhance the quality qualitative characteristics of good accounting information it should be something that you are able to compare whether it's between entities, whether it's from different periods, and let's see how it is done in here. All this that you are seeing in these schedules, in these notes, they are comparing the, the, the previous year to the year under review. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it shows like that. But I'm sure there's a section where they didn't show for the last four or five years when we get to the ratios. So that is it. The comparisons. Let's go there. I don't know why it is freezing. So when they, you check in their annual reports, they, all, they have up there some comparisons other than just for one year, they would compare even for two, three years, for three years and all that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's understood timeliness, we're actually saying, according to the act is that three months before, three months after, the year end, the reports has have to the reports the annual report or the financial statements has to be issued because that is where that, that timeliness comes in. Understandability users have a reasonable knowledge of business and activities, and they will show it in there the principal activities which which the which this particular company is undertaking. Mm -hmm. So on the elements of financial statements that basically was actually looked at and we are able to see it in here. When you are starting with your, with your income statement, you are seeing the revenues, you are seeing the expenses that is actually covered here. Mm -hmm. Income and expenses. You go to the balance sheet as well, they will show you the assets, liabilities and the equity, which shows in there, the elements of the financial statements. So obviously what is in the financial statements has been recognized. They have measured it, whether you're using historical measurements or whatever, but that has been measured. <laughs> Up to this end, any, any questions before we go to group accounts? Yeah, maybe just to to just appreciate that uh, uh, this is probably a summary mm. of uh, the whole financial reporting. Mm. And you know, we will always overlook this camp in front where we see questions. This is uh, has been treated just like by the way, mm. you know, which is not very good. Now, from here, I think uh, uh, you are building a guru. Yeah. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah. But then, uh, one thing that I find always is this issue of uh, accrual and historical uh, issues that I've just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So, what could be the clarification? Uh, historical accounting or accrual accounting? What are we doing in our country? And what is the difference between these two? Okay, so first across, that is one concept that we use when we are actually preparing the income statements or so. It, we use actually all the financial statements, we use across or matching concept. I'll, I'll define it off the cuff. I, across or matching mm -hmm. concept says that the revenues end must be matched against the expenses incurred in earning it. You are not using cash flow accounting, cash accounting, you're using across accounting. And this is what it means. The revenue that you see in the income statement, it does not really mean that that is cash. 
you could have actually generated revenues without cash, meaning that maybe you are actually selling on credit basis. But whatever activities you are doing in pursuit of this revenue, you find yourself incurring expenses. Whether those expenses you are paying them on, or it's on credit, which I would say locally, the Congole, they have to be matched for you to get your profit or loss. If we are using cash method, would ignore anything that is does not involve cash movement. Historical uh, costing is basically a measurement methodology that you use. Where you are saying your initial cost less if it's assets, your initial cost less accumulated depreciation, it actually gives you your net book value, which you actually plug into your balance sheet. And on an annual basis, as your machines are actually working, they are losing value through depreciation, which this depreciation is actually considered as an expense, which should find itself in the income statement. Obviously, as you move on, you'll be learning for sure that depreciation is a non-cash item. But I always say on the other side, when I'm doing my modeling, that depreciation is not a non-cash item. In business schools, they like to use that's a non-cash item. In modeling, we make sure that when we're actually modeling some businesses for the company, we make sure that that depreciation is equal to the MMRA, which is the major maintenance reserve account. So whatever you're depreciating, you're actually taking physical cash and putting it in that particular account. So that when you are going to have this major, major maintenance, though that is the money you're going to use to actually maintain your assets so that you take them, you take them back to what they were. This is ideally the concept of depreciation. Once one misses that concept, as an organization, you have problems where if you want to do maintenance, you go to the bank to actually borrow for maintenance. Why? Because you thought depreciation was a non-cash item and you never came up with an account. You never came up with an account where you should be keeping what you are depreciating since you are calling it as an expense. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. I get it. Because normally if, when we are doing cash flows, they tell us at the back depreciation mm -hmm. not a cash item mm -hmm. so uh, that is what goes into our mind mm -hmm. that it's a fictitious so ideally that if if if, if, if you are running if you are running a company properly what comes in as depreciation mm -hmm. up there right it should also equal to mm -hmm. the levels of your capex that you're going to introduce if, if, if as a company, you don't want to grow your asset base, but you want to maintain your levels. But also, if you know you don't show it in there, it should be that cash that you are going to show down there as, as closing cash, which goes into the balance sheet. When you try to segment it, it should actually show that you have this, what you're calling free cash. You have this cash, which actually goes into the MMRA, Major Maintenance Reserve Account. You have this component of cash which goes into the debt service reserve account. Then it gives you the total account, the total amount. So you should be able to break it down. So as companies, they should actually move away from the concept of thinking that depreciation is a non-cash item. Therefore, you can spend, you can have it in the income statement, but doesn't mean a thing. No, it does mean a thing. It gives you the levels of the reserves that you should keep specifically for maintenance. Otherwise, at the time that all your assets. Because yeah, I've seen most. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've seen, you know, I worked for Karen Motors at one time. Mm -hmm. And when we are doing these financial reports, you know, uh, that issue of depreciation, it's like excess cash. But you see, when the machine broke down, the machines break, breaks down, we, we had no money mm. you know, to maintain them or to put the vehicles on the road, mm -hmm. those tankers. 
back on the road. Yeah, so you are really opening my mind. That mm -hmm. We need to have adjust an account for depreciation, specifically in the bank, mm -hmm. so that when time comes for repairing, you keep the free to test supersonic pace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a reserve, actually. It's basically a reserve. <laughs> and, and I hope one day, yeah. as we move on, as we move on developing uh, accounting standards, improving them, we'll reach at the stage where we'll stop calling it as depreciation. We'll be calling it as maintenance reserve account. And our auditors must, be, sure. must verify sure. that this depreciation that you have watched, it, it's actually tallying with it. The accounts that you have opened, the cash which is in this account, which is specifically as a reserve account. In that way, then yeah. we'll be adding more value to our shareholders because the shareholders they just see our depreciation. They don't mind. It can that that reserve account it can act in the similar way that the debt service reserve account acts, such that at the time of maybe disposing of this company, that is the amount of money that it will be shared among the shareholders. Whenever you have major maintenance, at a certain given time, maybe every five years, you use that reserve account to do major maintenance so that you, you bring life into this particular uh, 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 investment. Our company. And that's a concept that True. even in business schools we should we should yeah. start and learning the concept of depreciation and learning it better as a reserve account. Yeah. It's more or less like a sunk sunk account. Is it sink fund? <laughs> I don't know the quite sink account or sink fund. I don't know. That's how it's supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. I hope it makes sense. A lot of it, actually. Imagine if very it's a motor vehicle. Let's just put it in a very simple way. A motor vehicle. A motor vehicle, mm. maybe bought it at, say, 100,000 kwacha. And you are, as a company, you have assumed that this particular vehicle's lifespan is five years. And you are depreciating it at, uh, yeah, the depreciation, annual depreciation charge is 20,000 kwacha. So that at the end of the fifth year, you have, you have zero, 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 zero. So, you open that depreciation, you open, you have, you have, you have every year, you are depreciating. And yet you have, you have, you never opened a reserve account for, for that, for your motor vehicles. What will happen at the end of the fifth year? NSA, are you now managing to talk to us? So Sidin, what is going to happen at the end of five years? in terms of the fleet of vehicles that you have? They'll be grounded because there will be no maintenance. And so you'll have no vehicles. Everything will come to a standstill. But if you had kept money like you mentioned, that uh, we keep these funds as a... Fred, there's someone calling. Yes, Ernest. I was thinking that I started right from a one and a nine and a one. What happens? I'm a simple. At some point, I'm distracted. I actually have to say, I'm not a student. Sorry, Sidin, I didn't get you. I, I Ernest was calling, and uh, my phone actually at some point, uh, my my network uh, froze. I didn't get what you're saying. We are, we are talking about the motor vehicles. Yes, I was saying that. Eh? 
if the if you are keeping money in an account, the reserve account, you are assured that the fleet of the vehicles will be on the road. Mm. But if, if for five years that money is, is not kept, it means that you're free to come to a standstill. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So there, there, there will be no source of income to put the vehicles back. It's like recapitalization. Yeah, yeah. So basically, that's what. So meaning that most companies will have to go to, to the lenders, uh, maybe for, for short term financing, to go and get a fleet of vehicles. Right? So what does it mean? It means that that depreciation, <laughs> it's very interesting. It means that that depreciation you are charging the income statement, whatever levels of depreciation on motor vehicles that you are charging, instead of using it as a reserve to keep that, you, you kept on maybe that is the money that you are using for your, for your pay bills, paying this, paying that and all that. Or even operations, guys, even it operations. appears as if it's free, man. Yeah, yeah that's it what it appears, appears as if it's free. So that's a concept that uh, companies must start developing. And, 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 and I'm seeing it as we move on. I'm seeing there will be an evolution in the accounting in the accounting uh, fraternity where the, what we are calling as depreciation and the, in business schools calling it as non-cash item that is going to change hmm? sitting you get it is is going to change sure. so slowly we'll be actually moving and i was just telling my colleagues when when we we're doing these integrated reports i, I, was, I was i was telling them i was saying you know what <laughs> When I look at where International Accounting Standards Board is driving to, all these standards they're coming up with, we are actually moving, drifting away or drifting from our crews to cash. I'll give an example of IFRS 9 on provisioning doubtful debts. What I say, if in the next three months you check that you cannot collect the money, provision it as, put it as an expense. So all you're actually saying, yes, your revenue is up, then you're brought in this provision for doubtful debts. In bringing this provision for doubtful debts, all you're actually saying is that we cannot collect the 100 quarter that you said we're going to collect. If you bring in 40 quarters provision for doubtful debts, all you're saying that we can only be, we are only in the position to collect on, well, we're in the position to collect only 60 quarters. And this is what we are going to put in the income statement. But you do it systematically or intelligently or shrewdly so, where you're showing the revenues using the matching concept, but then you press it in with the provision for doubt, doubting whatever revenues that you're going to get there. When you net it off, all you're saying is this is the cash we're going to collect from these revenues. And that is where the conversion, cash conversion rate comes from. I'll give you another standard. Um, aesthetics on impairment. That one, all it is actually just doing is that it is computing what you call impairment is the computation of lazy assets. That is what it's doing. Because then it says, impair what you think does not add value. That is dead weight. Oh. As a person that watch, um, I don't watch soccer. I stopped watching soccer. I, I watch UFC, <laughs> mixed martial arts. There's one thing that I have come to learn, and I always want to relate this to finance or to accounting. Before the fighters go to fight, they are weight, they have their own weight classes. But in those weight classes, what they have done is that these fighters, they actually go for weight loss. They, 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 they call it cutting weight. 
But all they are cutting from there, they are not cutting muscles. Mm -hmm. They are cutting dead weight, which is water, fats, those are the things that they are cutting so that they actually go meet within those weight classes. That is what I state six does. It is pointless having huge asset base, which is actually generating less cash flows. Mm -hmm. Those days we used to value companies using the asset base. That's the most ignorant way of valuing a company. It's like you have all these huge assets. You have, you have Lamborghinis at home. You have all these other beautiful things, but yet they are just packed. Yet mm -hmm. they are not in the position to generate revenue for you. What's more, they are not even in the position to generate meaningful cash flows, which you can actually use to grow your wealth. So why do you need them? So you impair them because they are not adding any value to your wealth creation trajectory. That is how I state six comes in. And even when we go to standards, I'll be training, teaching you on these standards, using these practical things, not regurgitating. No, that's the most boring way of looking at it. You look at even just, I give an example of, of, of IFRS 16 on leases. Those days, leases, you, you were, you were, you were, you know, a, 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 with leases, they were categorized into two forms. You had what you call operating lease and financing lease. And it determined, you could determine which one should yeah. sit in the balance sheet, which one should not sit in the balance sheet. And that was one way. And that, that standard was more of devil's eye because it was encouraging fraud. <laughs> So what would you actually do is, I have this particular asset. I've realized that I'm not getting the return on investment. When we compute the return on investment, it is very low. So almost towards the end of the, the, the year, I convert that asset or whatever it is, maybe sell it or whatever, and lease back. But lease back instead of financing, a lease, lease it back as an operating lease, meaning it's not going to sit in the balance sheet. There will be just a component of just for that annual, 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 just the annual portion, which will sit in the income statement. So then whoever is looking at it will be blind to the obligation that the company has. So I316 comes in, flashes of I-17, which was basically a very useless uh, standard on leases. It flashes it off, brings I IFRS 16, which then now does not segment. It's leases, leases. There is no operating or financing lease. Everything, all that you have to actually, you have, you have to show your obligations. You have to declare your obligations in total on leases and show it in the balance sheet. Whatever annual obligations that are coming in we are paying, it goes into the income statement. But you have to show a full exposure that you're in. But they used to remove that exposure. So you find that the company looks fine. And yet in Angongole Zambia, it has a lot of obligations. Because leases are also obligations. Yeah. You get that. Yeah. And leases, once it comes there as a liability, up there it comes in as an asset. Right? So as it comes in as an asset, what, what they used to do, they would remove it as an asset and they remove it as a, as a lease liability. What are they doing? They are showing that like the obligations are lower. They are showing like the assets are lower so that when you do your, your, your return on investments and all that you have very good ratios. I don't see understanding the practical way. All these standards 
there was there is a reason there's a business reason why they are the why, why they are there and most people do not understand they see standards as very boring pieces of accounting no they are business standards they are not accounting standards so the moment you, you see them in that way and you explain them in that way you have no problems at all no. Say something. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> you know, uh, when it, talks, it, it comes to standards, the way you are explaining, uh, especially on the IS-56, the impairment, mm -hmm. it was appearing as if it's something big somewhere. Mm -hmm. So the way you have broken it down, it makes a lot of sense. That you just have to remove excess. Mm -hmm. uh, Lazy assets. Stuff, which is not mm -hmm. yes, which is not generating income. Mm -hmm. So from this perspective, I'm now able I'm able to relate that when they say impairment, we are just removing uh, those uh, assets, excess assets which cannot generate income. Mm -hmm. It makes sense to me. The uh, IFR uh, uh, S9 uh, provision for doubt for debt. It makes now a lot of sense because we are saying this uh, uh, list of uh, uh, receivables, we have a few hundred, mm. but we are doubting if we thought they will pay. Mm. Okay, so that doubt, you, you remove it from the, 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 the assets mm. uh, coming as a. Uh, so to me, it makes a lot of sense because these things we are just remembering the market for information. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, we have forgotten one, yeah. So it, it, it was not arriving home to say this is the how things move, you know. So I'm also like, happy to be updated that that you know, recent if say segmented uh, uh, those which we used to call operating yeah. and those which we used to call finance. I didn't know about that, hmm. yeah. So now. <laughs> I'm coming in. <laughs> yes. So, and so because I've done that, eh? there's nothing you can hide and say, no, this is an operating lease by using your justification so that you don't show it as, as a liability. You have to disclose it in full down there in the balance sheet that this is a lease liability. And that lease liability is actually broken down into two. You have the current lease liability, you have also the long term. So, you're showing everything there, meaning that you are showing the full exposure. But those days they, they were hiding them because they wanted to improve the ratios. So it was more or less like the devil's eye. It was actually a betting uh, uh, wrongdoing. So even when you look at all these standards, trust me, as you move on, as we start looking at these standards with me, we'll not look at them as accounting standards, we'll look at them as business standards. Even when you look at the environment, 36, I've, I've done a lot of environments. I developed models for our subsidiaries and the like to try and do the impairments. First thing that you actually look at, even when you're determining the, the discount rate, I've seen in here, it was one of their major issues when they were looking at the Ambea project. But in impairments, you don't use the discount rate for the company, whatever it is, where you, you weighted average costs, where, where you, you look at, you look at your, your equity uh, and a combination of equity and, and debt. No. It goes further when you are doing it in practice that you have to also look at the country risk, what we call the ERM, equity risk premium for a country. So all those that you hear, Moody, um, standards and poor, we use those. Then we need to actually check what, for example, Zambia, what is the equity risk premium, Zambia as a country? That is then now, that is what you actually use as part of your equity. Then you go to the other side now on debt. On debt, again, you look at what is the average, what is the industry debt ratio, debt equity, yeah, 
it's, it's, it's DE, debt equity ratio. We use also that. You go now into the, the industry. What is the beta for this particular industry? If we are dealing with de telecoms, what's the beta for this industry so that you are able to determine risk? So you get that industry beta. And then now you can use your KPM or whatever to calculate risk. Then go to your famous what? Because KPM, uh, 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 basically what it is actually looking at that pricing model, capital asset pricing model, that's how you call it, isn't it? It's just basically looking at the, your, your equity, sorry. Then now you, 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 you look at the component of that so that you are able to compute the weighted average cost of capital. And that's the weighted average cost of capital that you're actually going to use in your DCF to check the future discounted cash flows. Your future cash flows, then you discount them to today. But even when you're doing that, there should be assumptions because you're looking at it for five years in the future. One of them would be the PGR, the basic growth rate. What rate are you going to use? I know most of the time we use the US PPI, which is about 2%, but also you need to know that you don't use a rate, a growth rate, which is higher than the growth of your GDP, because then it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Because your cash flows cannot grow beyond the levels of your GDP. That's where the logic comes from. So you have the PGR, which you're using. Then, even when you're doing these discount rates, and it's not like, it's not as, these things are so practical. You use half year discount rates. And it's very simple. Those things you learn in school discount rates, it's like you're actually assuming that your, 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 your revenues will come at the end of the year. But that is not true. You prorate it. So if you prorate it, then it means that you're going to actually find the average. So the average is divided by two. So we start with the discount rates. If you have for 10%, the first year, it will be 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, and it goes like that. So when you get now your future cash flows, you discount it today for five years. Then you have also the terminal value, which goes into perpetuity. You add it together. You add it. I'm not adding it together, so my English is now becoming bad. You add it and check the, the, the asset base, the carrying amount. You compare the carrying amount with what you have. Because you assume that that carrying amount that you have in your balance sheet, if you find it's higher than your ability to generate this cash, which you have discounted to today, then just know that you have a problem. Meaning that those assets that you have, most of it is lazy assets. So you have to chop it. Otherwise, if you don't, even your, your return on investment, if it's 10% the way it's supposed to be, you'll find that it will be around 0.5% or whatever. Why? Because you have huge asset base, which is not generating meaningful revenues or cash flows. Therefore, that, those assets are lazy. And we call them lazy assets. Or well, they are fully sweated assets. They can't generate anything. So your assets, instead of becoming a blessing, they become a curse. Yeah. So then this standard comes and says, no, 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 no. Can you try to remove excess fat? But then it also does, you know, the importance of that standard. And that's why I call them all accounting standards are business standards. It also regulates how the directors, it regulates the CAPEX appetite 
from the board. Then they will know that if we load so much capex, which is not being translated into meaningful returns, when they do a test of impairment, they will cut it off. And it will question our investment decisions. Guys, I end here. Let me hear from your, your views so that tomorrow we can dedicate it on group accounts. <laughs> Wow. We just hear Moody, Chani, Zambia is related to what? Yes. Now we know what it means. Mm -hmm. mm. Those are very important yeah. ratings when we are doing the valuations and doing the impairment. Mm -hmm. So before we close, yeah, checking out, can you give me your views about today's? Same one. From my side, today's same one uh, uh, is a, just a, a replica of what we learned yesterday. Now we are we are seeing it with our physical eyes. Was yesterday, it was more of uh, this is what happens. This is this. This is this. Of course, we understood. But when you brought in the statement of financial position, the audited financial reports from uh, Lafarge, the, now this thing is I agree. We know the reason why this uh, conceptual framework is critical. Mm -hmm. We understand what they deliver. You know, they now make practical uh, sense. When we are talking about the faithful account, uh, the, the qualities of uh, mm -hmm. The qualities of the qualitative uh, uh, aspect of, uh, of good accounting, financial information, then we see things like relevance, what it means. You know, we, we, we look at the uh, aspects of uh, comparability. Right now, I can see from the statement of financial position here, we have 2019, 2018. So that's comparability. Mm -hmm. We're able to compare. But from our side, uh, from public service, I see people comparing a budget to, to, to expenditure. I don't know if that also relates to compatibility, comparability. Yeah, let me explain this. Oh, I don't know what. OK, let me explain it. <laughs> I've, I've been in the budget office uh, for over six years. When you are just looking at, when you are comparing the actuals against your budget, you are just, basically what you're doing is that you're just testing your plans against your actuals. But I always advise those that prepare management accounts, not only to look at mm -hmm. the budgets against the actuals, they should also go into the prior years. Where, and this is how I started doing it with my with our team, with my team. You will look at the past three years. Then you have you have the three years segmented. You have the average of those three years. You have you have you have your your actual and your budget. If you are looking at the quarters, you look at the quarters, if it's quarter one, you look at the quarters for the segmented in the last three years, you look at the average of that quarter, you look at the actual, you look at the budget. Analyzing it in this way, it gives you an opportunity to test your plans as well, because you know that those plans were developed by man Therefore, they are susceptible to errors. And these errors would come in one either from planning, maybe operational because there have been changes that have actually happened, macroeconomic or whatever changes. It also broadcasts or exposes what you call padding the budget. 
Others will call it padding, others will call it pudding the budget. I don't know the proper pronunciation. But what that padding the budget is, building slack in the budget. Others would build this slack intentionally because they want to, to, to beat the budget where they overstate expenses and understate revenues because they know it's difficult to meet those revenue targets. So they'll do it deliberately, others deliberately, others it's just out of ambitions which they did not test their own abilities or capacity to meet those ambitions. And from my experience, a budget contains a lot of ego-driven errors. What next to me and I'm crossing this is a manja manja. Hello? Yeah, I'll call you in the next five minutes. Okay. So, most of those, they are ego-driven. But again, also, it is out of ignorance. Where even when they are coming up with assumptions, those assumptions, assumptions they even know true that these assumptions will not materialize, but they'll have them there anyway. So, Comparing the yeah. actual against the budget and try to determine whether your year was good or bad, that's the most dumb thing that you can do. This is why in some companies, if you haven't actually, if you said you're going to spend so much and you failed to spend, in some companies, you'll actually be punished for that. You'll be held okay, accountable. Yeah. The, from the yes. NGO world, you know, it's called the uh, 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 lack of capacity to spend. So they have to change managers. Mm. They're not aggressive enough to put this money. Because that money has a budget line and a time frame. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that comes in but again in the ngo in ngo world it also encourages useless spending when you go to the year end because you did not actually meet that budget then now you go flat out now having seminars workshops now you start inviting Roy consult to do doing all these other things <laughs> but it's something that can be tested yeah. You get me sitting. These are the things that you have to look at. So if you look at the prior year, when you, are, when you are approving the budget, it gives you an understanding whether you have a capacity to do what you have said you are going to do, which you failed to do in these prior years, and the average shows otherwise. So yeah. just comparing the budget against the actual, is, it is not the wisest thing. But frankly speaking, that is what is done in most of these organizations. <laughs> because they assume yeah. that the budget is so pure, yet the budget contains a lot of iniquities. It should also be tested. Sure. So I end here. Any last words so that we close? <laughs> no, to me, this is a would the quite a number of issues because uh, when I look at the uh, very fact that I had the problems, mm. you know, verifiable. Verifiable to me, I just thought maybe because now I see these people are able to compare, even call third parties to analyze your issues. Mm. And it should be so even as we are preparing reports. That's why you tell these people from districts and the provinces. Mm. Make sure what you have paint is the same as what is on the ground. Mm -hmm. Because when they come, they find it's different. Then render all these things useless. Mm. Yeah. Great. So thank you so much. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks.